slide I will tell you. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to have Sylvia Karayuki here today. She is a Kenyan researcher that uh, earned a PhD at the University of Chicago working on um, the identification of genetic variants associated with disease susceptibility. Uh, she's now back in Kenya, based at the Kemri Wellcome Trust uh, research program, like myself, working mostly on malaria. Um, to do so, she has many international partners, such as um, the um, Sanger Institute, and her work was recently accepted for publication uh, in Nature, and I guess that she will talk to us about that a bit today. And um, yeah, over to you, Sylvia, you can um, now share your slides. Okay. Uh, um, just sorry, people, as usual, uh, or if you're new here, if you have questions, just uh, post them in the chat while Sylvia is talking, and I will answer them uh, in the end. Okay. All right. Here. Can you see my slide? Yeah, sure. Can just put them full screen. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Maureen. Um, yeah, so Maureen has already done the intro. We are colleagues at the Kemri Wellcome Trust uh, in Kilifi, and I am a human geneticist by training. So that's going to be the subject of my talk today, um, the human genetic factors that are associated with malaria protection. And I'll specifically be talking about the project that I've been working on uh, during the last couple of years as a postdoc at Kemri, uh, where we have been investigating this newly discovered um, human genetic mutation known as the Dantu red blood cell variant. Uh, we're investigating basically how it compares its protective effects. So I'll, I'll get a bit more into it during the talk. So just as a brief background uh, for non-malariologists, -mal um, so the ma malaria parasite has a complex life cycle where it spends some of its time in the mosquito host and uh, the other half of its life is spent in the human. Uh, and our group is mainly interested in the blood stage of the malaria parasite. So this is where the parasite invades the red blood cell, uh, matures, goes through um, uh, div cell divisions, and then busts out of the red blood cell and goes through this cycle again. And this cycle takes a total of 48 hours, two days. So this is the, the blood stage is, is the phase of the malaria parasite that, that causes all of the symptoms that we see, the serious malaria um, symptoms that, that we see in people. Um, and so malaria has had a huge impact uh, on the human genome over the last 5,000 years. Um, it, it, it causes a lot of death. It, it ha has been causing a, a, a huge uh, mortality for the last uh, thousands of years and has therefore ha had a huge impact on, on the genome and has led to uh, the positive selection of uh, genes, uh, human genes that are associated with protection uh, from malaria infection. Now, most of these genes have been found to have important functions on the red blood cell. So the most popular or the one that's most commonly known uh, is the mutation on the hemoglobin molecule, uh, hemoglobin B gene known as uh, sickle cell trait. So this uh, particular mutation uh, confers the strongest if, uh, protective effect against malaria that we know to date. So people who are sickle cell trait carriers uh, have up to 80% protection from malaria. That's better than any vaccine out there. Um, and so there are other um, protective genetic mutants, for example, the blood groups, blood group O has been found to be protective, um, and as well, alpha thalassemia, also in the hemoglobin gene locus, uh, G6PD, and more recent work uh, by a consortium of malaria uh, scientists, including our group in Kilifi, um, identified novel uh, protective uh, malaria mutations or variants. Um, for example, mutations in the calcium channel, and as well mutations in uh, the glycophorin gene cluster. So this is what I'll be focusing on on the talk today. So this uh, glycophorin mutation um, from the genome-wide, the large genome-wide association study was done a few years ago that included populations from malaria endemic countries in Western Africa and Eastern Africa. And they found that this new novel uh, glycophorin uh, mutation is found at highest frequency along the Eastern African coast. So this sort of white uh, slicey of the pie is the, the uh, 
frequency of this, of this mutation. So not only is it found that high frequency in, in East Africa, it's found at highest frequency in Kenya, in the Kenyan coast, coastal population, uh, specifically in Kilifi, which is where um, we, we are based at Kemri Welcome Trust. Um, and as well, uh, this mutation, so these bubbles on, on the right represent the allele frequency of this mutation. So, uh, and these are the populations that were involved in that uh, genetic study from Gambia, Malawi, Kenya, Cameroon. Um, and as you can see, uh, this mutation is found at highest fre uh, frequency of about 10%, uh, specifically in the Kenyan population. And then this uh, chart here basically shows the, the effect of this mutation. So on the x-axis is the odds ratio and anything to the left of uh, odds ratio of one is protective. So uh, in the Kenyan population, you see that the odds ratio is about uh, 0.6, which represents a protective factor of about 40%. So people who carry one copy of this glycoferrin mutation have 40% protection against malaria. And people who carry two copies of this mutation have up to 70% protection from malaria. So this is a protective effect that is equal in magnitude to the sickle cell effect. So this was quite interesting and exciting for us. Um, because not only is this mutation found at highest frequency in Kenya, but it also has a hugely protective effect. And so we were, we were curious as to, um, you know, how it goes about, what, what mechanisms of protection um, this mutation has. So further work by this uh, Malaria Gen Consortium um, further characterized the structure of this mutation. So this is the normal uh, structure of the glycophorin genes. On the reference hap haplotype, you have glycophorin E, glycophorin B, glycophorin A, and these result in these glycophorin molecules that are found on the red blood cell. So this orange uh, cartoon here is a glycophorin B molecule, and the blue one is a glycophorin uh, A molecule um, that are found abundantly on the red blood cell surface. But with, the glyco with this mutation, um, you have a series of duplications and deletions that results in fusion of the glycophorin B and glycophorin A genes um, that then result in this hybrid molecule, which has uh, glycophorin B in its extracellular domain and glycophorin A in its uh, transmembrane and intracellular domain. Uh, and this is what encodes the DAN2 blood group, group variants. So I'll refer to this mutation as the DAN2 variant from, from now henceforth. So the, the glycophorins are important molecules uh, that are found on the red blood cell. Um, they're important invasion molecules. So normally a when a parasite encounters the red blood cell, um, it has ligands on its own uh, surface that recognize uh, these invasion molecules in the red blood cell and that uses that uh, as an invasion pathway into the red blood cell. So glycophorin A especially is found abundantly on the red blood cell and is an important invasion molecule, but there are other different types of invasion molecules. So the, the pathway into, for the parasite into the red blood cell is redundant. But what we were curious about is what happens when the parasite encounters this hybrid uh, DAN2 molecule on the surface of the red blood cell? Does it, um, does it have any impact on, on parasite invasion? And also what is the impact of having this fusion molecule on the structure of the red blood cell? So those are what the re, uh, research questions that um, formed the basis of our work. And so to answer these questions, um, we did a series of experiments. So first we had to get these red blood cell samples um, from uh, children basically, yeah, uh, individuals who are involved in various cohort studies in Kilifi. So these are individuals who had already been involved in, in the ge uh, genetic studies previously. So we already knew their genotypes. So we knew and, and we, uh, the Chemical Welcome Trust has a really great resource uh, in the health and demographic system in Kilifi where um, we have a pretty good, um, you know, dem demographic system where you can track uh, where people who have been enrolled in these studies live, uh, where, which households they come from. So it involved a, a, an extensive amount of field work uh, from our group, uh, our, our group of field workers, where they had to go into those homesteads and basically ask for consent for these children to come to the clinic and get their blood drawn. So we could get red blood cells from uh, individuals that have two copies of the mutation, homozygous individuals, or one copy of the mutation, heterozygous, or no, normal individuals, non-dan2 um, individuals. So we sell, uh, 
collected about 42 red blood cell samples um, that represented these different genotype groups and subjected them to a series of experimental assays basically to ask the question what is the effect of this mutation on uh, parasite invasion and to answer this question we used a flow cytometry technique where you, uh, you basically stain the red blood cells from the different um, mutation groups with uh, different stains and then you culture them with the parasite and let let the parasite invade these red blood cells after 48 hours, you can quantify the amount of invasion that has happened in each of these different red blood cell sites. And then using live video microscopy, we were, we were also able to track the parasite invasion process uh, live and look at the kinetics of invasion and, and look to see what the differences in invasion were across the different red blood cell types. And we also characterized the red blood cell membrane structure, basically the the different proteins that are found on the red blood cell, especially the different invasion uh, ligands, and we could compare across the different genotype groups. And for this, we also used flow cytometry techniques as well as mass spectrometry. But today, I'll just talk about the flow cytometry results. And we were then, um, with in, co in collaboration with a group at the University of Cambridge Biophysics um, Cavendish Biophysics Laboratory, we were able to measure the uh, mechanical properties of the red blood cell um, using live imaging and, and membrane flickering assays. So this was a highly collaborative uh, project uh, that involved our group at Kemri and as well collaborators at the Sankar Institute and the University of Cape Ridge. And so what did we find? For the uh, invasion assays, we subjected these red blood cells to different parasite strains. So these represent 57, DD2, SAO75, GB4, and 7G8 are different parasite strains. Um, and the different colors are the different red blood cell types. So green is the normal, the non dan 2 uh, Orange is the heterozygous, the individuals that just carry one copy of the mutation. And purple is the homozygous, individuals that carry two copies of, of the mutation. So we saw a decrease uh, in the ability of the parasite to invade red blood cells. Uh, in individuals who carry either one copy or two copies of the Danto mutation. And this pattern was seen across the board, regardless which parasite you threw at these red blood cells, the pattern was the same. And then, and these parasites, these different parasite strains were chosen to represent different geographic locations. For example, 3D7 and GB4 are from West African origin. Uh, DD2 is from Southeast Asia, SAO75 is a Kenyan strain, and 7G8 is a South American strain. And all of these parasites also preferentially use different invasion pathways. However, the uh, inability of the parasite to invade was seen across these parasite strains. Uh, and we were then able to observe the process of parasite invasion using live video microscopy. So in this example, these are, this is a non dan to sample, uh, and this is uh, how a parasite uh, encounters the red blood cell and begins the process of invasion. So we're able to track this process and time uh, the, the, you know, get the timing of, of the invasion into these red blood cells. Um, and in comparison, this is a red blood cell from a dan to homozygote. And if you focus on this particular red blood cell, so these black dots are the parasites that are kind of knocking on the door of the red blood cell and just not being able to invade. Um, so these uh, video microscopy uh, data are able to, we're able to quantify the, the process of invasion, visualize and quantify the process of invasion. And so with the live video microscopy, um, we sort of saw the same results that we had seen with flow cytometry where there's a decrease in the ability of the, par in this case, we just use one parasite strain, 3D7. So a decrease in the ability of 3D7 to invade down to uh, heterozygous and homozygous individuals. And as well, we were able to time the process of invasion. So the du duration of time spent by the parasite um, pre-invasion, basically the parasite comes into contact with the, with the red blood cell and attaches itself and starts the process of, of invading, um, that duration of time was much higher in, in done to cells. And as well for the parasites that were able to invade, the amount of time that it takes to, from the beginning of invasion to the end of invasion was much longer in done to cells. So the parasites are struggling more to gain entry into the red blood cells. And so we wondered if perhaps the reason for this 
uh, resistance to invasion was um, the, the makeup of the invasion ligands uh, that are found on the surface of the red blood cells. So using flow cytometry, we were able to quantify the um, important red blood cell membrane uh, levels, uh, especially the, the proteins that are uh, important for invasion. So we found variation in, in the uh, membrane protein expression of, of different um, receptors. Uh, for example, glycophorin A and glycophorin B were reduced in DAN2 uh, individuals, while glycophorin B and band 3 were increased, and as well CD71 was also increased. So CD71 is an interesting one because it's a, it's a transferring re receptor or ion uh, channel. And is, and is mostly highly expressed in younger red blood cells. Um, so as an, a red blood cell ages, um, CD71 is depleted. So it seems that individuals that have this, that have this stunting mutation have younger red blood cells in circulation. And uh, finally, the, these important invasion molecules, basigin, CD55, CD44, were all the same. There was no difference in, in their expression on, on DANTU cells. And so, uh, as I uh, uh, said earlier, um, the process of parasite invasion into red blood cells involves recognition of different parasite ligands, um, or uh, of recognition of these invasion receptors that are expressed on uh, the surface of the red blood cell. Uh, and, a, and an important uh, invasion receptor is the glycophorin A receptor, and its partner molecule on the parasite is EBA175. So there are many um, previous studies that have knocked out these uh, parasite ligands, for example, EBA175 and EBL1. If you deplete them from the parasite, what happens is the parasite then adapts to using alternative invasion uh, receptor ligand uh, pathways. And so we thought, okay, if, if, glycof if there's, there's variation in the glycophorins in done to individuals, if you subject them to a genetically modified, if you subject a genetically modified parasite, for example, this EBA175 knockout to these DAN2 uh, cells, uh, what is the effect of, of invasion? And so the hypothesis is because this genetically modified parasite has adapted to using non glycophorin invasion pathways, then it wouldn't matter. Um, invasion into DAN2 or non DAN2 cells will be similar. But what did we find? the uh, genetically modified parasite strain was still, uh, there was still resistance uh, of invasion of this genetically modified parasite strain. There was less invasion in the Dantu heads and homes um, of this EBA175 knockout strain. So this observation led us to believe that perhaps this resistance to invasion is not a receptor like and specific thing. Perhaps there's something else going on that's preventing the parasite from gaining entry into the red, the red blood cell. And so um, using uh, live uh, video imaging uh, in, a process, in a technique known as, known as membrane flickering assay, uh, our colleagues at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge uh, are able to measure different mechanical pro properties of, of the red blood cell. For example, the bending modulus, tension, viscosity, um, and so we measured the mechanical properties of um, the red blood cells from the different genotype groups. And the striking finding was that membrane tension in the done to red blood cells was increased, uh, while radius was significantly reduced. So tension and radius are, are sort of uh, inversely correlated. The higher the tension of the red blood cell, the smaller the, the, the cell is. And so we wondered, we're curious about this tension, and we wondered if perhaps this could be causing the, the um, inability of the parasite to enter. And so to measure the relationship between membrane tension and invasion, we simultaneously measured uh, tension. Uh, in this case, this is how the membrane flickering analysis is done. Um, you basically score the tension values of these uh, five red blood cells that are adjacent to a schizont that's about to rupture. And then once the rupture has happened, you then score the number of invasion events that happen in these five uh, red blood cells. So here, uh, uh, Viola who did this uh, imaging is indicating that the parasite has made contact with the red blood cell and is deforming uh, the membrane. And then the blue arrows indicate where invasions are happening. 
So then you have a, you can look at the relationship between tension and invasion based on this uh, data. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, so what we found was um, on measuring, um, yeah, so the measuring uh, the relationship between tension and invasion, we found that there was a threshold, uh, at, um, a red blood cell membrane threshold above which um, parasites were not able to invade. Uh, there was failed invasions um, above this membrane threshold. Uh, membrane tension threshold. So, and this this observation was seen across genotype groups. Uh, so, the higher the membrane tension, the less likely that parasite invasion will happen. But importantly, um, we found that majority of uh, Dantu red blood cells had membrane tensions that were above this threshold. Then, this is what would explain um, the resistance to tension. Individuals that carry this mutation have these red blood cells that just have this. Uh, highly rigid um, uh, red blood cell membranes and, and they're uh, resistant to parasite invasion. And so to further um, understand how it is that high tension re uh, reduces or impedes the ability of the parasite to enter the red blood cell, uh, we, we used a live imaging uh, technique to uh, measure the amount of wrapping that the parasite, uh, so if, when a parasite makes contact with a red blood cell, it wraps the membrane around itself in order to enable it to get into the red blood cell. So we found that uh, red blood cells that had high membrane tension, uh, parasites were less able to wrap these uh, membranes around themselves, whereas those that had lower tension, the parasite is able to wrap it more. So this is the contact section or the length of, of contact that's measured here on, on the, the y-axis. So low tension, less contact, uh, sorry, high tension, less contact, low tension, more contact, more wrapping, and therefore parasite is able to enter. In addition, we saw a relationship between uh, parasite deformation of the red blood cell and tension, where uh, red blood cell membranes that uh, had uh, much higher tension, um, the ability of the parasite to deform these red blood cells was weaker. So on the y-axis is a uh, deformation score with a score of zero and one being weak deformation and score of two and three being strong deformation. So all the uh, red blood cells that are on this side of the tension threshold uh, are more weakly deformed by the parasite. And uh, because the reviewers were not just satisfied with that, uh, we needed to show uh, that tension directly, that it is indeed tension that is directly impacting uh, the parasite invasion efficiency. And so we needed to mechanically perturb uh, the membrane tension of normal non to red blood cells and check to see if this has an effect on, on invasion. And previous studies have used various molecules to change the mechanical pro properties of red blood cells. Uh, and this paper um, used glutaraldehyde to increase, uh, they showed that treating red blood cells with glutaraldehyde increased membrane tension um, without affecting bending modulus or other uh, biophysical properties. So in a way, if you treat red blood cells with glutaraldehyde, this chemical, you mimic the physical properties of, of the DAN2 red blood cells. And so we found that treatment with 0.01% uh, uh, glutaraldehyde, so this are increasing concentrations of glutaraldehyde, um, this on the x-axis is increasing tension, so the more glutaraldehyde you, you use to treat your red blood cells, the higher the tension. And on the y-axis is the parasitemia, the amount of invasion, that, uh, parasite invasion that has happened. So you treat your red blood cells with tension, with 0.01% glutaraldehyde, you, the tension of these uh, red blood cells in, is increased to a level similar to the DAN2 cells, and parasitemia is decreased significantly. Uh, so this proves that it is indeed, indeed tension and not any of the other biophysical properties that impacts parasite invasion efficiency. All right, so I'll just summarize what we thought. So we basically found the mechanism through which this novel um, DAN2 polymorphism or DAN2 mutation that's found at highest frequency in East Africa uh, is able to confide its protective effect through impacting the biomechanical properties of, of 
the red blood cell. So I'll summarize this by showing the invasion, showing this illustration of the invasion events that happen in low tension red blood cells compared to high tension red blood cells. So in low tension red blood, red blood cells, normal, for example, non bantu normal red blood cells, the parasite makes initial contact with the red blood cell membrane, it reorients itself, and then be, uh, begins the process of membrane deformation uh, and wraps its, the mem membrane around itself and forms a tight, tight attachment uh, to the membrane and then begins the process of, uh, in, of invasion uh, and internalizes until the process of invasion is complete. So that's the normal uh, invasion process in a normal cell. But in a cell that has high tension uh, membrane, for example, dantu, most of the dantu red blood cells, the parasite makes initial contact with these red blood cells, reorients itself, but is only able to weakly deform the membrane and is not able to wrap the membrane around itself. And for this reason, invasion is not successful. Uh, this failure of invasion. And so this is how, in a nutshell, we describe the mechanism of protection of this dantu mutation uh, against malaria. So I'll stop there and just uh, leave a picture of all the people that were involved in this work. This was a highly collaborative project between a group at the Kemi Wellcome Trust and the group at the University of Cambridge, University of Oxford, as well as um, at the Wellcome Sangha Institute. All right, that's it for me. <laughs> muted, I'm muted. <laughs> so I was saying, thank you so much. Uh, it was really amazing. I really loved the little videos. I'd actually never seen a video of the parasite invading uh, like this. Yeah. Um, do you have an idea of the time frame of that video? Uh, like yeah. a few seconds, but... About 20 seconds, yeah. It's very, very short. It, it happens it's really or is Let it, um, yeah, so it's just like how speed so This is really, really sped up, okay. but this process is, is complete, usually completed within uh, 20 to 30 seconds. The, the full process from contact to invasion is, is uh, done in no time at all. So yeah, it's, re it's really remarkable to be able to even see it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy, yeah? Um, yeah. Okay, so guys, if you have questions, just put them in the chat now. I'll just start. Um, maybe you said it, but I uh, didn't get it. Uh, where was the mutation discovered? Because since it's only present in a few countries, because I think that in West Africa, it's really, really low. So oh, yeah. uh, you need a bit of luck to uh, end up finding it. Was it found around here? Yes. Yeah. So, so they, so these, these were samples from both West and East Africa, uh, and they typed these individuals genome wide, uh, and yes, found found that this mutation was most common uh, in most common in the Kenyan population, but you also find a bit of it in the Tanzanian and Malawian population. So it seems to be tracking in the East African uh, mm -hmm. coast, basically. Yeah. Okay. So they like they found it while they were doing the genome of all these. People over exactly. there. It wasn't okay. Fine. So um, they were yes, doing a genome wide association study uh, for all these populations, and they were then able to to find it, uh, track it in the East African population. And was it the purpose of that GWAS, or was it like a fortuitous? Uh, so the yeah oh yeah so the main purpose of the GWAS was to just look for which genes are associated with um, either malaria risk or malaria protection. So whatever bubbled up to the top whatever signals that were most significant um, are then what you fight, like hone in on. So of course the, the number one signal was uh, sickle cell trait that has the biggest protection. Um, and then they found, then fortuitously, they did find this uh, mutation in this glycophorin gene cluster and decided to, to do more fine mapping on it and, and figure out the structure. And um, yeah, so it, it was a bit of a fortuitous finding. Yeah, it's funny with GWAS, so sometimes you just have your idea and when you mix up groups, you end up like buying your nose on something you have never even suspected and were even not considering. Exactly. It's a, it's a hypothesis free approach, which I am. A, yeah, I, I, I like that because you don't know, you have no idea what, what you might end up finding. And for example, if you had just done the GWAS on a population in Mali or West African population, you wouldn't have found this, this sort of yeah, no, yeah, that was yeah, important. It's important to, to have a GWAS that, that has representative populations across the board um, and a large uh, sample size 
Um, and yeah, just to, to go about your hypothesis freely and, and see what, what you'll find. So this, this previous study was basically formed the, the subject of my entire postdoctoral work. So now I'm, I was functionally validating this, this signal that they had found. And have they been looking for the mutation somewhere else now? Yeah, they've, they've, they've typed, even within Kenya, they've typed um, populations from Somalia, they've typed populations in, in uh, the west coast of Kenya, the Lake Victoria um, Basin is also another malaria endemic region and have not found this mutation oh, sorry, anywhere else. Coastal. Yeah, it's only tracking within the East African coast. Yeah. Which is curious. So yeah. So I should have said uh, future directions is to understand why it is that that this mutation is is tracking only within East Africa, um, and to do more sort of population genetic studies to understand uh, when this mutation might have arisen. It could be that it just arose pretty early in in terms of the evolutionary clock. It might have just arisen spontaneously over the last thirty. I don't know how many years. Um, and just happen to, to be selected for within uh, specific population types in East Africa. Uh, but this is, this is going to be subject for future work. Mm, amazing. I have other questions, but I'll first read uh, the question of Jordan Ferreira from Cambridge. He's saying, thank you, thank you so much for this talk. Is the dental mutation associated with any other trait or issue regarding the function of red cells? Right. Um, yeah, so, so far, we've just been able to, to see this association with uh, membrane tension. Um, and we did do some clinical hematology for the individuals that were involved in the study and found that there was an association with uh, mean, mean cell volume, mean corpuscular volume, MCV, uh, that individuals that had this dante mutation had, had a lower MCV, which I guess uh, makes sense because we also found from, from the live uh, video imaging that the Dantu cells had lower or smaller radii. Um, so, so far the, the associations have just been with these uh, mechanical properties of, of the red blood cell. What, again, future directions is to figure out what is the physiological effect of having... Yeah, that was, I had the same question than him actually. Yeah. Like, you know that sickle cell really affects people because of the new physical properties and then it creates clots and everything. So you were saying that with this mutation, the, the red blood cell are thicker and are more rigid. So you could imagine that it could affect or it circulates exactly. how like the in oxygen intake is um, affected. Yeah, so this is this is going to be subject of future work. Is first of all, we want to know if there, there are any clinical uh, impacts of, of having this high membrane red blood cells. One clue is the fact that um, these these individuals have this marker of young red blood cells. So it seems that perhaps these high membrane red blood cells are being cleared quickly by the spleen. So when the spleen encounters this red blood cell, it sees that this is not necessarily normal. So it clears them faster. And so these individuals are having to uh, produce more and more uh, red blood cells all the time. So yes, we want to understand what the effect, physiological effect of that is. Um, out of the, the, the people that were involved in the study, there are no obvious clinical symptoms. There's no anemia, the, you know, from the hematological indices, everything appears to be normal. However, we need to go back into the clinical records over the last 20 years um, and try to track and see if there's any association with other things, perhaps maybe increased risk for bacterial infections or something else. But yeah, so this is, this is a uh, subject for future work. Yeah. So I was continuing this, this question, but I guess we really had the same. We were saying, what about the deformability and capacity to, uh, to go through capillaries? So it was um, just the same question. Um, yeah. yeah, I hope we answered your question, Jordan. Um, so you said at some point that uh, if you delete some of the ligands that are present on the parasite, the parasite will just adapt and uh, use others. But uh, is the invasion as efficient? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so in general, parasites use multiple redundant invasion pathways, um, and they they do it in various ways. So, so some of them can use um, glycophorin A. Um, you, uh, 100% use glycophorin A, others 
use 50% glycoporin A, 50% a different invasion ligand. So at all, you know, for all these different examples, invasion efficiency is, is similar, which is why I think, you know, the parasite invasion process is so redundant. It, it makes evolutionary sense for the parasite to ensure that it can enter the red blood cell any which way uh, it can. Um, so, and which is why it's, uh, parasites are able to switch so quickly. If you, if you, if one of the ligands is not working, it switches to the next one, next one. So one of the, I think, interesting thing for us is, is that the red blood cell is not just an innocent bystander. It has also adapted <laughs> to this clever parasite. And, and we're seeing that this mutation is, um, you know, uh, impacting the actual physical property of the red blood cell to make it such that the parasite cannot invade uh, regardless of whatever invasion pathway it tries to use. Mm. And have you looked, sorry, there, there are still a few parasites that manage to invade, invade the dead cell. Have you looked yeah. as if the release of the parasite is as efficient? Um, yeah, or if, okay, so if- it manages to burst red, red blood cells in the yeah. same way. No, we have not. So we only manage, we have only managed to do this over one life cycle. We only sort of track it up to the point of invasion, but we haven't, we haven't done a time course. Like we haven't done a long course growth mm. um, experiment to see what, what is, so what is the fate of the parasite that does end, uh, end up inside the red blood cell and how does it adapt uh, itself to being in this very, very um, hostile environment. Uh, so uh, again, subject for future work, but this is, this is something <laughs> we are very interested in doing um, is, is now isolating the parasites that have invaded these down to cells and, and just characterizing them, putting them into culture and seeing um, what's different and unique about them. Yeah, because you would imagine that if it's trickier for them to deform the membrane to enter, it might also be difficult for them to deform it, to burst it or... Burst out, yeah. You would think it would have a really big hit on, on their viability. Um, but that's, yeah, that, that would be something interesting for us to track. Yeah, just look, look at, looking at the, the length of the cycle when they are in the parasite and checking if it's like shorter or longer or same than our normal infection. Exactly. Um, or if, if they mature the same, the same way, they, they, they definitely take a hit. So it's just, yeah, what, what exactly happens to them? What is their fate? Um, this is a subject of a future PhD student. <laughs> Great. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm out of questions. I think I've asked everything. Uh, if you have other questions, um, ask them first because uh, we're almost done. And if you're typing, again, raise your hand so I can know that you're typing and I'll shut that out on you. Um, <laughs> anyways, thank you, Sylvia. It was really, really, really nice. And I was actually telling my friend that like, I know what you do basically, but we've never really taken the time to go into details because we barely yeah. talk about work. And it's like, it was really, really, really nice. Well, like, really nice work. Yeah. Okay. We don't talk about science in a very formal way like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess there are no questions. Thank you so much. That was really, really great. And uh, thank you. I'll talk to you later. Thank you everyone okay. for joining. Bye. Thanks, Maureen. You're welcome.